its elements because you have a choice of whether you take additional cards or you don't take cards. Now, this has been a popular game uh, in casinos since the late 1800s, and it was solved in 1960s. So uh, it had been around for about 70 years and was quite popular. Uh, but there, it had so far eluded solution because while the rules of the game were very well defined and there was no theoretical challenge, uh, the fact that it was dealt from a deck of cards and that there were a large number of discrete, uh, I call them card order dependencies, uh, it made it very difficult to enumerate all the possibilities. And even though it would be not theoretically complicated to simply write out on paper all of the probabilities, uh, it would result, it, it would be millions of different combinations that you would have to write out and test, and so it wasn't able to be done manually. Now, around 1960s, the early 1960s, when digital computers first became available for use in, in frivolous uh, pursuits like uh, figuring out card games, um, uh, a gentleman named uh, Edward Thorpe uh, decided he was going to use a computer to uh, determine the um, uh, optimal strategy for blackjack. And uh, he did that work uh, in conjunction with some people at IBM. And in 1962, he published a book called Beat the Dealer. And this book was uh, a watershed event in uh, professional gambling, or in, in I say, the modern interest of, of mathematicians in gambling. Because for the first time, it was now possible to use a mathematical strategy to achieve a positive expected return at a popular casino game. So basically, anyone who read this book and learn the strategy, could walk into any casino and be playing with a positive edge against the casino. And this, this started something of a revolution. In fact, that's, that's how I got into the game. I was caught up in this. I read the book and uh, quit what I was doing, which was attending university, and moved to Las Vegas and uh, became a professional gambler. So, uh, you know, it, it, it worked and it, it still does, and it really um, generated a lot of interest. Um, what, uh, what was interesting about this, though, is as a... Um, uh, you know, as a technique, was that it wasn't, uh, it was the use of technology to enumerate possibilities. So it was the use of a computer to assist in an arduous manual calculation task. And it wasn't really a theoretical breakthrough, but it was still uh, uh, an interesting use. And in fact, the, the, way that it's, um, the way that it's done now in blackjack, because computers have gotten so fast, people don't even bother to make calculations. They simply write simulators. So if, the, for instance, the rules of the game of blackjack are very easy to encode into a computer, and when you want to answer, well, what is the advantage for the player or the house or what particular strategy is best, it's easiest rather than, than writing out a detailed sort of calculation by computer is to just make a simulator, let it run millions and millions of times or billions of times, and then tabulate the results, and this will answer any question. It's sort of the, the brute, force, brute force method of uh, calculation. Um, now, the last one I wanted to talk about, though, and this is the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart, is uh, horse racing. I would say that this particular form of gambling has inspired the most serious and sophisticated efforts in terms of applying modern uh, mathematical techniques to a, to a game of chance. Uh, partly the reason is because there's so much money in horse racing. It's, a, it's a played for very high stakes around the world, especially here in Hong Kong, and therefore uh, it... Uh, attracts a lot of people who are trying to win at the game. Now, in racing, uh, the challenge uh, that you're faced with is trying to estimate each, horse, each horse's probability of winning. Uh, now, unlike a well-defined or, or idealized game like blackjack, which is really just a, a, a set of rules, basically, or, or a game with dice or cards, which again is uh, something that is um, not, you know, it can be set down as rules, you know, let there be a dice, let it have six sides, let each chance, each side have an equal probability of coming up. These are, are sort of analytical games which don't require any investigation of the real world to solve them. Horse racing, however, involves uh, dealing with real individual horses and modeling real world phenomena. So it's a little bit, it's a departure from pure mathematics. Now, it, if you wanted to, uh, to win at horse racing, uh, you have to construct a model as we said, to estimate the horse's probabilities of winning. Now, the, the model you want has certain desired, uh, there are certain desired characteristics of such a, such a model. Uh, one would be that it could combine heterogeneous variables into an overall predictor of horse performance. Uh, a second is that uh, 
an estimate of the horse's wind probability as the desired output of, the, of, uh, of that model. Uh, third, the probability estimate should sum to one within each race. That's kind of a, a common sense constraint because we know there's going to be one winning horse out of each horse race. And a way must exist to, to practically estimate the parameters of the model uh, with real data. Now, we could um, view the expected performance of a horse as being the result of a, a number of different variables or, or, or factors uh, related to the horse's past performance or the condition of the race. I've written out one such specification here for, as, a, as an example, uh, and we could say that the horse's expected performance equals uh, some coefficient uh, theta times the average finishing position. I call that AV fin. That's a variable which would be the average past finishing position. Uh, another plus another coefficient times the number of days since its last race. A third coefficient times the weight carried by the horse. Uh, uh, a fourth coefficient times the win percentage of the jockey, etc. cetera. Uh, you could imagine those going out to, you know, maybe a hundred different characteristics of a horse. That all can be expressed by the, the equation at the bottom, which is that the, um, the expected performance V of a horse is equal to a, a weighted sum of, of different, uh, different variables describing the horse's past performance. Now, an actual horse performance in a race, even though its, its expected performance might be a deterministic thing, you know, the sum of a, a number of different predictor variables, we all know from common sense that random things can happen in a horse race or there might be unknown variables that are affecting the horse's performance. So we could say that an actual performance in an individual given race for a horse might be this uh, deterministic component uh, V plus some random error epsilon. Uh, this is a, a, a common formulation in, in statistical modeling of all sorts, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. But if we, if we make the assumption that this uh, epsilon is a normally distributed uh, quantity, then that's going to result in a performance distribution uh, which is normally distributed around a certain mean. And there would be a graph of that. Now this is, for instance, uh, a graph of the expected running time of a particular horse. So we think that a particular horse is going to run a race in an elapsed time of just under 90 seconds, uh, elapsed time being on the, um, uh, the, the, the x-axis there, but that his actual performance is going to be somewhere around that due to unknown factors that we can't uh, control for or can't predict. So that's the expected performance of one horse. This would be a look at what uh, an entire race of horses might look like. We might have, uh, let's say, 10 horses in a race, or I think we've got eight in this particular example. And what we see are a number of different overlapping normal distributions uh, showing, uh, you know, different potential running times for, for, for different horses. Now, I've, I've intentionally made these so that each horse doesn't have an identically, uh, uh, an equally wide distribution. Some, are, some horses might be more consistent and have a, a, a sort of a narrower uh, distribution of possible running times. Others might be more uncertain in their, in their performance and have a, a wider standard deviation. But this sort of mess right here is a number of overlapping predicted running times is what you really have in horse racing, and this is, leads to something called the probit model of horse racing, and the chance of a particular one of these eight horses winning is sort of the chance that his performance will fall, it will be the leftmost of all of these overlapping distributions, and that's expressed by the equation on the bottom, um, which is a, a rather uh, complicated equation. Um, when if we assume that that is the model of a particular race, then you can create a likelihood function which you can associate with a past series of race. And this was basically uh, the likelihood